Welcome from Toronto, Canada. My name is Anna Sangster from the International Federation on Aging, and it is my pleasure to be with you today to bring the latest webinar in the WHO IFA age-friendly series entitled The Decade of Healthy Aging, a Proposed Approach to Monitoring Progress. It is a privilege this morning to be joined by Dr. Ritu Sadana, Unit Head for the Division of Universal Health Coverage Life Course at the World Health Organization. Dr. Sadana has had a key coordinating role in the development of various WHO initiatives, including the Global Strategy and Action Plan on Aging and Health, coordination of the Consortium on Metrics and Evidence for Healthy Aging, and the development of the baseline report for the Decade of Healthy Aging. Now, before we kick things off, just a couple housekeeping notes. First, the webinar recording and slides will be, ma will be made available to all registrants post-webinar. And second, please ensure that all questions are submitted by the Q&A function. This allows for better coordination during the live Q&A and for us to keep record of any unanswered questions. So please do avoid using the chat function. With that said, I'll now turn, turn things over to you, Ritu. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm really um, delighted to be participating uh, today and to be exchanging ideas on the approach to monitor progress for the decade of healthy aging. And um, what I'd like to focus on is what's in and what's not into the proposal, and then how we can discuss over the next few years how we can increase what we would like in, in terms of accountability. Uh, what's been terrific is that um, we have been working WHO with the International Federation of Aging for many years. And I see this as a bridge also to what we were able to do together in 2018 and what we will be doing together in 2021 as part of launching the decade. We really do share the same values that we want to optimize healthy aging and that we realize we need collaboration for action and the enthusiasm to actually launch the decade to be able to meet the rights and needs of older adults with measurable impact. So just to start out, I want to give a quick mini review because I know many of you are aware of the decade, but just to say that for healthy aging, we have two perspectives when we look at older adults. One is disease, which is based on the international classification of diseases, where we look at individual problems. And one is health, where we have a comprehensive profile of what individuals uh, experience, their capacities, their abilities, and their functioning. So if you look at the photo of this woman's hand, she has rheumatoid arthritis. And you may be thinking she's having difficulty buttoning her jacket. But actually, if you look at the whole picture, what she's actually doing is buttoning her granddaughter's jacket. And I think that kind of captures what the difference is when you look at a disease perspective and when you look at a health and comprehensive perspective. And what we know is from the World Report on Aging and Health, what matters to older adults is to optimize that health side, that healthy aging. And I think you've already um, heard us talk about that healthy aging is a process. It's a process to develop and maintain functional ability that enables well-being in old age. And it's made up of a couple of different parts. One is a person's intrinsic capacity. It's in their body. Uh, and the other part is the environment, everything that's around them. And it's how they interact their body with the environment, uh, their body and mind, that then enables functional ability and enables people to eventually have um, well-being. It's important that it's not equivalent to disease-free and it's not specifically um, about a particular age. And it's connected to the uh, approach that Nobel Prize economist Amartya Sen talks about in his capabilities approach. So, but what does this mean kind of in practice? How do we actually say what is the individual components of healthy aging? Well, WHO has this classification for functioning disability and health, which gives us a normative or standard approach to break up the individual components of intrinsic capacity into different subdomains. So cognition, psychology, sensory, uh, neuromusculito, metabolic, there are many others. It provides a profile of the individual and how their body and mind are working. The second area, the interaction with the environment, we have drawn also on the ICF, and there are some key areas that are relevant for older adults, and, may, and I would say for everyone. 
That's what are the products and technologies? What is the natural and built environment? Is it enabling? Is it age friendly? Um, the support and relationships that people provide. Also the social norms and attitudes, are they favorable or are they ages? And then the broader services, systems and policies. And this is a real big category. We understand that. But those two interact to actually then in, enable functional ability. But what do we mean by that? Well, the first area is very basic. Yes, it's meeting basic needs. Uh, then it's about learning and applying knowledge, making decisions. Mobility, can you get around, which is different than neuromusculatal uh, in terms of intrinsic capacity. It's also, can you build and maintain the relationships around you and can you contribute to families, communities, or society? Uh, this could mean participation in many different ways. So this is how we've unpacked it. I think you've seen this pretty famous uh, graphic from the World Report, which sets out a framework for action, where we talk about intrinsic capacity as a hypothetical line and functional ability also saying we want to bump these up through a range of things that health services can do, that long-term care uh, can do, and also um, multi-sectoral actions throughout the environments. And the point is to optimize uh, and enhance reserve as early on, to have a de delay in any declines, to modify the rate of decline, and ensure that environments can be supported at any level of intrinsic capacity. And that's what enables functional ability um, for older adults, even if they have a decline in intrinsic capacity. So moving on to just finish this short introduction, the decade of action is needed to really accelerate the interest and the importance of optimizing healthy aging, and at the same time ensuring that it applies to everyone. And that's where the health equity component is really important because everyone should have a fair opportunity to attain their full health potential and that no one should be disadvantaged from achieving this potential. And I think, again, this is one of the really important shared values between IFA and WHO. Now, healthy aging is our WHO's response to population change and um, health. It's a rights-based response. Um, and that's really important because if you look at the figure, it shows how in the dark blue, it's the, um, the distribution by age of world population right now, which is primarily a pyramid. But by 2100, this will, 2100, it's going to be a bell shape, according to sort of the UN mid-level projections. But the response for healthy aging is just not only about the numbers. It's really that rights-based approach. It's a capability-oriented approach. And it's inclusive of all individuals, with or without disease, rich or poor. So what I'd like to talk now um, to really focus in on uh, progress and measuring measuring progress over the next 10 years, and really uh, ramping up accountability in the dialogue with different partners and stakeholders is six different areas. So I'm going to start off with um, just giving a very brief overview of what the proposal for the decade of healthy aging includes. Um, you can see the full proposal on WHO's website and it will be addressed by the World Health Assembly in May. Um, and uh, we've already had very good comments and discussions during WHO's executive board in February. It includes four key action areas, changing how we think, feel, and act towards age and aging, developing communities in ways that foster the abilities of older people, delivering integrated care and primary health services responsive to older people, and also providing older people who need it with access to long-term care. There's also four enablers to sort of support this measurable change. It's the voice and engagement of older people, families, and communities, nurturing leadership and capacity building, connecting stakeholders, and ensuring data research and innovation advances for this areas. 
So what I want to now really focus on is how are we going to know that we're actually moving forward? And I really like um, a heuristic that colleagues in Thailand have been using for many years. And it's about the triangle that moves the mountain. Because a mountain is something actually impossible to move. But what they have come up with a way is that if you have a social movement and you have political involvement aligned and you create the relevant knowledge, you can move the mountain. And this is the approach that we thought about when developing within the proposal for the decade, how to advance and really ensure that we can move this mountain to optimize healthy aging. So clearly the social part is that we must include older adults' voices. And the decade proposal notes, we need to extend opportunities to older people to raise their voices and meaningfully engage and influence the discussions and the policies and the actions. But we also need to bring in the perspectives of younger people, other family members and caregivers and encourage that that is part of the discourse and dialogue. And we need to support governments and civil society organizations. That's what makes the, the triangle and the mountain move. On the political side, um, for UN agencies, including WHO, we have a lot of different approaches to have technical inputs with recommendations, resolutions, alliances, and different types of secretariat strategies. But the most binding approach is a negotiated strategy and an action plan. And that's what the global strategy was. And that's what we are hoping the decade, the, the second, the new action plan uh, uh, linked to the global strategy and its accountability framework will reflect this negotiated strategy. So that's as uh, binding as uh, we can get in this type of uh, strategic um, approach from WHO side. And of course, if it becomes a UN uh, decade, that this would be then added in light with what the UN General Assembly's uh, approaches to accountability. On the technical side, we need to define older adults, but there's no single accepted um, definition. And in some ways, it's okay because uh, we have these extra years of life because we are having longer lifespans, and they're not just for older people. Those extra years of life are for all people. But definitions like this, they are also social constructs, and they reflect uh, a negotiation, and yet this particular aspect of an age is somehow framed as a technical solution. So, WHO is using 60 and over. I think colleagues in the UN tend to use 65 and over. This is reflecting a, a range of changes in social norms. But we also know that the idea of chronological age and different categories of older adults are used by some. We also know that some people are very against using chronological age and would prefer to just say second half of life, maybe around 50 and over. We have to also recognize that there's countries who have very specific national goals. It's not so much about a particular age becoming old, but saying, for example, as Japan, that during this century, everybody should live to 100 years. So what WHO is proposing is that um, we use 60 and over, but we disaggregate five-year age and sex groups at least to 85 plus, if not 95 plus, so this can allow both policymakers and analysts to see the data. We also have to recognize in this negotiated and social construct, intersectionality, whether it's sex, gender, sexuality, age or ageism, race or racism, class or caste, social inclusion or exclusion, and other marks, markers of equity or inequity um, that really differs around the world and even within each country's related to language, literacy, people's livelihoods, their place of residence or household structure. I'm sure you can add to this list, but just to say that the technical aspect is not um, trivial. In terms of putting that mountain and moving it, we also have to think about where do we want to move it to? What's the scenarios that we're planning to think about how we want to track 
progress. So um, clearly we know where countries are in just the percentage of older adults right now. Um, and we have estimates from the UN on how that's gonna change in 2050 in terms of the countries with the darkest blue having 30% or more um, adults over the age of 60. And if you go to the, uh, to, you know, 2100, you're gonna have a lot more blue based on today's approach to estimate projections. Um, so we have to take that into account even for the next decade, 2020 to 2030. So one of the things that we're planning and we're designing is in order to track impact over time, whether it's in your community or city or nationally or globally, is thinking through that some policy steps are gonna take longer to put in place, maybe the next five years, and then they'll take off during the next, the five years after. Others may take off much quicker, but to reach everyone is gonna take longer over these next 10 years. So we have to be smart in understanding which progress indicators and milestones are so important that we need to flag those, and then which are the outcome indicators that we absolutely need. And we have something that's in, I'll get to that in a moment, but there's also things that are not in. And this is what I would like us to think about. So one thing that our member states made super clear in the development of the proposal for the decade is that they wanted us to draw on existing monitoring frameworks. So what did that mean? It meant that we could take stock of the vision and the four action areas, but we had to build on the indicators of progress agreed on the global strategy. We could also extend other WHO and UN global policy instruments to include older people. And um, where, where member states have already agreed to that indicator. Uh, and we also want to make sure that those four enablers are linked to. Uh, in the proposal, we've said uh, the proposal says that measures of progress will be, you know, used, there'll be indicators, it'll be monitored nationally, subnationally, including average levels and distributions, that member states will be engaged in this process, and WHO and other UN agencies will, and, and, and I'm hoping other partners as well, of course, will be also participating. So what does this mean in practice? It means that we can draw on the Madrid International Plan of Action on aging. Uh, and there's some, you know, there's the three goals, the three pillars and goals, we can use that. However, one of the flags too important to understand is that monitoring is primarily decentralized at regional and national levels. So, um, so that's something that we have to think about in terms of what we can draw on it. Uh, there's periodic global discussions on progress. So the 56th Commission on Social Development uh, in 2018 looked at things, and that's where we really had a terrific discussion talking about the decade becoming a bridge between MIPA and the SDGs. So in terms of the SDGs, we're all very familiar, but I think what's very important is that it gives us the entry point to look at inequalities and act on health inequities. And it also is the reporting is based on national statistics offices who in each country are the conduit for addressing um, how the disaggregation occurs and what is reported, not only for health, but for all of the different areas. And that's really important. Now, obviously we can draw on the global strategy on aging and health, and uh, we have 10 progress indicators at the country level, and we also have the mandate to develop outcome indicators for healthy aging, and I'll come back to that. We also have from WHO, the Global Program of Work, um, GPW 13 as we call it, uh, and our impact framework, which includes healthy life expectancy as an overarching indicator, and then we have these triple billion indicators and also 46 programmatic indicators and targets, which are primarily related to SDGs. So based on that, I can then sort of share with you what's already in. Just kind of a quick overview. 
So we've got those 10 process indicators from the global strategy, and we have some midterm data from 2018. We've got the sustainable development goal indicators. Half of them are at the population level, and, uh, and we can look at them with different groups to understand, is there something specific that is really important for older adults? So we've done that with the Titchfield City Group on age and age disaggregated data that's made up of national statistics offices around the world, also UN agencies and civil society groups. We have healthy aging, functional ability and intrinsic capacity in particular. And we are currently developing uh, these for the baseline report. We have healthy life expectancy. And of course, we want to engage our WHO regions and country offices in actually coming up with this information in collaboration with national statistics offices. Of course, we have a similar plan of engagement that our colleagues in the UN have, um, decide, have, have conveyed to us as well. So just to give you an, a, a, a view of what these global strategy midterm progress indicators are, because these ones have been accepted by member states to continue. So there's 10, and the first one is number of countries with a national focal point on aging per region. So we have shared this information publicly by region. And uh, if you look at the top graph, it shows the number of countries in each region that have a focal point, that's in green. Then the ones who do not, that's in red. And then importantly, where we have gaps in information, that's in yellow. So what we are doing right now is working with our regional offices and country offices with the first priority is to eliminate the yellow. We really are trying to understand where, what the information is from countries that we were not able to get information. Then we want to see, did any of those reds flip to green? Then finally, we want to understand, have the greens maintained or updated uh, where they are? So the second, um, the second one is, do they have a plan or strategy on healthy aging? And you can see uh, in 2018, 88 countries out of 194 did. And to give one example is uh, the state of Qatar uh, developed a national strategy and it has one key pillar on healthy aging. And from that, they have 11 very specific things that they have committed themselves through an action plan to do. And they're very much reflecting what was in the global strategy first action plan. And it also maps to the proposed um, action areas and enablers in the decade proposal. So it's very exciting to see how there's increasing policy coherence, not at, only at the global level, but also at the regional level, the national level, and then also at the subnational level. So indicator three is, are countries having national multi-stakeholder forums where older adults and a range of stakeholders are engaged? And you can say the number is 88. It's a coincidence uh, that the number 88 comes up a couple times. Uh, the fourth indicator is, is there legislation and enforcement of this legislation against age-based discrimination? So you can see that uh, you know, this varies across regions and countries in terms of um, how many countries. There's a lot of opportunity in many countries to advance in this area. Uh, in terms of the fifth indicator, it's what are the regulations to support access to assistive devices? Uh, in this one, take note that uh, Euro is all 53 countries are in yellow because they were unable to capture this information but they are doing it now. This is connected to the WHO approach. We have a essential list of assistive devices, many of which are super important to enhance functional ability of older adults. The sixth one is a national programs policies to foster age-friendly environments. So this is different than what I'm going to show you in a minute, but this is what the national policy has. And here we, in two, two years ago, we had 34 countries. But just as an example, I checked this morning on the age-friendly 
uh, world website, uh, we do have a thousand cities and communities around the world and 41 countries engaged. And uh, we're hoping that the push, of course, will be to include regions and have them represented like Africa over the next 10 years in a much greater place, a uh, greater, greater number of cities also in Asia. So the moving to the seventh indicator, it's policies to support comprehensive assessments. This is comprehensive assessments of older adults that look at their intrinsic capacities and understanding where they are and what support they need in order to, uh, in order to maintain and optimize their capacities and also improve their abilities. Uh, we have a huge demand in this area. Even if this number is 27, my guess is when we have the updated information in the next couple of months, there will be many, many more countries that are putting in policies. Uh, the eighth indicator is also, do countries have national long-term care policies? And this is very much looking at systems approach, whether it's in facilities, in the communities, or at home. But what is the approach to provide uh, health and social care to older adults uh, who need it? So one example from, uh, from programmatic work is uh, what colleagues have been doing to put together guidelines and uh, very specific country packages to support in integrated care for older people. And these six areas that the, that the focus is on as you can see, look at things from intrinsic capacity that supports functional ability, limited mobility, depressive symptoms, cognitive decline, uh, malnutrition, visual impairment, and hearing loss. You'll see more about hearing loss uh, in a few slides from now. So the last two indicators are uh, looking at uh, the evidence and data that countries can draw on, particularly that are nationally representative. So uh, the number nine is do countries have cross-sectional nationally representative data on health status and needs of older adults? And we have 54 countries um, that have these cross-sectional surveys. The 10th indicator is, well, not only do, do you have it cross-sectionally, but you also have it over time, longitudinally. So then you can actually check what are the changes. You could look at causality. You could monitor the impact of policies or programs in different areas. And so we have a smaller set of countries. Now, out of those 54 on number nine, we have really been checking very carefully which ones have information on intrinsic capacity and functional ability. And those are the ones that we are really drawing on to be able to come up with uh, estimates of intrinsic capacity and functional ability that we will be reporting uh, later on this year. An example of the groups that we work with are, the, as I mentioned, the Titchfield City Group on aging and age disaggregated data, because again, the national statistics offices are the ones who are able to bring in data from multiple sectors, harmonize it and disaggregate it, and make older adults visible. We're also working with um, networks such as the Cochrane and Campbell Global Aging to come up with evidence on what can be done to actually improve intrinsic capacity or functional ability. So are other groups, but Cochrane and Campbell Global Aging has been very important in raising the vis visibility on the methods to do evidence synthesis that are looking at that health perspective and not only the disease perspective. So we also can draw on the SDGs. Um, and I know that you're much more, you're very familiar with um, the different indicators and you know, the different tiers of indicators depending on how much data they are. But in the proposal, you will find a table that lists uh, many of the SDGs that the Titchfield City Group, as well as Health Age International, very carefully reviewed to say, these are the ones that we really want older adults to become visible in. So I'm just gonna share a couple of them with you. So for example, for goal one, we really wanna know 
the proportion of population living in households with access to basic services distinguishing older people. For goal two on zero hunger, we want to understand the prevalence of moderate or severe food insecurity in the population, again, also distinguishing older people. For goal three, which is for WHO, uh, the custodial agency, we want to understand the proportion of the population with a large share of household expenditure or income on health, also distinguishing households with older people. We've done some initial work, colleagues have, uh, looking at the uh, six country SAGE uh, multi-country uh, study on older adults. But there are many other things um, in, in goal three. Uh, my colleagues who are working in different UN agencies will be able to highlight what they think is most important, but this has gone through an initial process. So for example, on quality education, we all wanna understand um, older adults who also have skills in information and communication technologies um, because they're not often made visible. In the proposal, there's a, uh, you will find for the following uh, uh, seven additional goals, um, specific indicators where uh, the Titchfield City Group uh, has identified as priorities to disaggregate for older adults. So that's something we can work on. And because member states have already agreed on it, there's no reason we can't improve disaggregation and make older adults visible. So I mentioned that WHO already has the mandate to have estimates for healthy aging, that person-centered impact. So we are really, really in the process right now of developing those estimates for uh, intrinsic capacity and functional ability based on national surveys. We've already done some really interesting uh, construct validity analyses, uh, looking at data from US, Canada, and India different surveys, but lots of data. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Jyotis uh, uh, Amutvali has been working on this with people from USC and University of Virginia. Terrific results. And we are now understanding also ways to pull off information from web-based maps to look at environments, individual cities and communities, understanding how much time it takes to get to certain places or services by foot, by public transportation or by, uh, by driving. And we will have some really interesting results as a baseline later on this year. As I mentioned, we can also use uh, healthy life expectancy. And um, healthy life expectancy, as you know, is made up of two components. It's life expectancy uh, that is based on all-cause mortality rates at each age and decrements to health which is called disability in years lived with disability, but it's really decrements in health uh, at each age. And um, these are expressed in this uh, phrase, years lived with disability. I'm showing in uh, data from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, because what they've done is for each five-year age group, 60 to 64, which is the top bar in purple, down to 95 plus, uh, which is the blue bar at the very bottom, showing that every, for every age group over the last couple of decades, we have had a continual improvements in healthy life expectancy, even at the age group of 95 plus. And I think this is really important because we, we are making progress in terms of adding more life to years. Now, as healthy life expectancy is made up of mortality and decrements to health, we can also complement that health approach with looking at the changes in global mortality or by countries. Um, it may not be the featured part in the way we look at progress, but we cannot ignore it because these are the components that go into healthy life expectancy. So we've done some quick analysis of WHO data showing that death rates by five-year age groups starting at age 60 have been going down since 2000. These are global averages. 
and, uh, and the global averages obviously mask a lot of variation. But when you also look at older age groups, we also see since 2000 uh, and, and before, if we, if we included data before, that the death rates are going down. Notice the scale is a different scale in terms of death rates compared to the younger, older age groups. When we look at the top causes of mortality, already from age 50 for men and women, it's primarily non-communicable diseases. I've circled tuberculosis because for men between the ages of 50 and 59, it's the only non-communicable disease. Uh, it's the only communicable disease that's included in the top five. Otherwise, the categories, the top fives are pretty similar. There's some differences uh, in terms of uh, men and women, but ischemic heart disease and stroke are pretty much number one and two throughout. The levels, of course, are different for men's and women. And when we get to the slightly older um, age groups, disaggregated, we see that it's um, all, uh, all non-communicable diseases with the levels between men and women um, uh, uh, different and also the levels between 70 and 79 and 80 plus uh, different. Now, if we go back to just looking at years lived with disability or the rate of YLDs per 100,000 population, good news is we also see those going down since 2000. Um, even if it doesn't look like a dramatic change, these slight improvements are very important. Again, it masks global variation. We also see um, this in the oldest age groups maybe a, a little bit more of a plateau, but uh, we do see some uh, decre decreasing, uh, decreasing YLDs as well. Um, if we look at the top five causes of years lived with disability, so these are non-fatal conditions, many are related to intrinsic, to areas of intrinsic capacity, like hearing loss. And then others are related to non-communicable diseases. So this is for the, the, the ages 60 to 74 disaggregated, also by males and females. And here is for the ages 75 and 80 plus. So you can see hearing loss is one of the big burden areas. Uh, it's the number one for men and women from 70 onwards. So now I just want to pause uh, as we have a few minutes left to think about what's not in. And I say for now because we have the collective opportunity to think through what we can put in. And we have several opportunities to do that, luckily. So what's not in is further specific indicators for each of the four actions and the four enablers. Um, I, I, would, I, I think that something very specific relating to the functions of health systems, which is, of course, what w, one area that WHO is pushing forward, uh, should be very specific on ensuring universal health coverage meets uh, the needs and rights of older adults. We already have a hook in the SDG3, but we have to make it more clear. And we have colleagues, not only in WHO, but in other agencies who are thinking through ways to say what are the menu of services and options for financing sustainability wise these services and and that's something really important that governments are are also keen to understand there's nothing in on research systems in terms of the pipeline for research evidence synthesis or knowledge translation um, we, are, we have focused the decade proposal on the second half of life, older adults, um, but maybe there's something earlier on in the life course, some very specific things that help set up those optimal trajectories of healthy aging that we would want to include. And we don't have anything on financing of global um, development aid or even or the or not only global development aid but commitments by countries themselves to support older adults not just in health but in you know multi-sectoral action as well 
So I just remind us that what were the four action areas and the four enablers? And I want to flag that already at that 56th Commission on Social Development, we collectively agreed that we needed to have an indicator of engagement of older adults. But because member states did not want us to include any new indicators in the decade proposal, I think this one should be on our top, you know, number one on our list to ensure that we can get it in um, next time. Um, we have really good examples of what countries are doing. For example, uh, we have a, a, a case study that's been published on how Chile introduced reforms to its universal health coverage program in 2005, and they explicitly included services uh, that are covered for older adults to improve intrinsic capacity and functional ability. And, and this is really crucial, they focused on increasing coverage in the lowest income quintile. You need those two together. Remember, WHO and IFA share values, optimize healthy aging, and improve health equity. We could have something on research and, in, and really pushing what types of research production comes out so that it looks at this um, comprehensive view on older adults. We can see that the number of articles are going up. But of course, we have to make sure that these articles are synthesized and that the evidence is used. Uh, we've looked at issues across the life course. And again, the proposal for the decade focuses on older adults, but there may be some very crucial things, maybe in child development, uh, that put, older, put people on that positive trajectory. Uh, and we know that uh, aid is highly concentrated uh, among children and then up until about uh, age 40 in terms of development assistance for health, whereas the health burden is um, increases with age. And it's not just about having more funds for issues that are relevant for older adults. It's also about recognizing that we can invest in that first half of life in a better way to set up those trajectories and that we have to invest in multi-sectoral activities so that we have that enabling environment. So it's not just about the health sector. And we have really good examples of countries that are trying to package that um, the way they're looking at the life course and setting up older adults uh, to have that optimal approach. And, you know, it's important that we're showing countries from different regions. This is an example from Colombia where they reorganized their primary health care around different stages of the life course and looking at a social uh, determinants approach. So it's very much multi-sectoral. Um, and, and in a way, I, I showed what Qatar is doing. Qatar, in a way, is doing a very similar thing. So this is really encouraging, and it, it's one of the reasons why countries are increasing their demand and appetite for really looking at healthy aging. So just to conclude uh, on this um, fifth section, and I'm almost completed, is that in the proposal, uh, we have put in uh, uh, that there will be reporting back and progress uh, in 2023, in 2026, in 2029, and then 2030. So we have these opportunities to improve what's in and really uh, work together to have that accountability, um, uh, not only with member states, but also other stakeholders that need to act together. So the first thing though, is the baseline report, and that should be issued in October uh, of this year. And just to end on that, uh, to say the baseline report will look at three basic questions. Where are we on healthy aging? Where do we want to go by 2030? What are the options? And how are we going to get to that optimal scenario? We will consider innovation and research. And I'm hoping that over time, in you know, between 2023, 2026, et cetera, that we can really discuss together how we're gonna accelerate impact, how we're progressing, 
And of course, how have older adults driven the process? So um, we're engaging older adults, but we're also engaging ministries of health. And so my last slide is just showing that we have eight countries who are developing case studies uh, led by the Ministry of Health with many other stakeholders, really focusing on what data and information they have and how they're using that to make decisions right now. And this includes countries in all of our regions, plus India and China. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ritu. Uh, just before we move into uh, the Q&A section, I just wanted to provide a brief update on the IFA 15th Global Conference. Uh, in view of coronavirus and the, the impact it's having on everyone around the world, and to ensure the safety and security of our delegates, we've made the decision to shift the conference, originally scheduled for the 1st to 3rd of November 2020, to the 3rd to 5th of March 2021. So we hope all of you will still be able to join those of you who, have, who are planning to, uh, and more updates will come uh, as, as some content is adjusted in light of, in light of COVID. So um, as we turn over to questions, I'm gonna go with kind of probably the most pressing question we received. Um, to what extent, Ritu, might the COVID-19 pandemic impact the direction of the decade of healthy aging? And will the WHO include this factor on overall longevity patterns? I, th those are, um, the first question is a very good question. And it's something that um, the staff in terms of the, uh, uh, because you're, you, it's something that the staff will be informed about in terms of the way the World Health Assembly will uh, deliberate on all of the items. Uh, I have seen uh, an early agenda that was um, put together for the World Health Assembly and uh, the proposal for the decade is on the agenda, but uh, we are waiting to understand what format the assembly will take place and um, if that has you know, any implications. Now, in terms of COVID and uh, longevity, uh, in our group in the, in the, in the Department of um, Maternal, Newborn, Child, Adolescent Health and Aging, we have a, a special unit on monitoring and evaluation that is working with the COVID monitoring and evaluation group. And I think right now they're really in the surveillance mode of understanding uh, cases and uh, deaths. And we're really pushing for disaggregated data and disaggregated data by age and sex, by country and place of death. Because a lot of countries initially were not reporting deaths in, um, uh, in, for example, long-term care facilities. But we have a lot of information on our website, and I would encourage you to, uh, to, for people to look on our website for everyday updates on, on this information. The broader or longer research questions, I think we have some time to think about those in, in greater detail. Thank you. Thanks so much, Richo. Um, the next question we have is a, is a little bit related to the importance of language. So could you speak to the importance of language? Um, for example, what would be the impact be of using terminology like aging city on older people? Sorry, aging city? I didn't so the use of The use of terminology like aging cities, what impact does that have on older people? So the use of language in different, in different terminologies. Well, I, I mean, part of what WHO does in terms of norms and standards uh, and our mandate is to ensure that those are translated into the six official languages of WHO. So, um, for example, I showed the International Classification of Disease or the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health. Th those must be in the six official languages. But I think what you're more getting, the question is more getting at, how is it that we can um, take uh, concepts even I can say healthy aging uh, and the very specific terms in English or maybe French or maybe a very specific term in Arabic and um, on one hand have an official translation, but on the other hand, how can we have terms that we think um, are not pejorative or that are acceptable and that really communicate the positive spirit that we're looking to? And I think that's something where we have to work together with our um, collaborators in countries who actually know the context, who know the language, 
and, and really work with civil society, uh, country offices, uh, other partners in countries to really get the language right. And also language is dynamic. Um, you know, how uh, the, words and the words that are in and appropriate that my kids who are 20 and 18 use may be very different than what I think. So I think there's many dimensions to the dynamic nature of language as well. Thanks so much, Richo. Okay, so changing pace a little bit. There's a question here about um, the SDG chart target on NCDs. Uh, and the, the understanding was that NCDs are not tracked above the age of 70. So in light of that, without kind of concrete data over 70, how can civil society organizations make a robust case for a convention? Okay, well, I, I mean, that's a, a question that's uh, really important and one that uh, many of us have been giving a lot of thought to. Uh, it's uh, the NCD uh, mortality uh, uh, indicator looks at four major NCDs um, between the age and mortality between the ages of 30 and 70. So for example, uh, for children and young adults, they're also excluded and, and that's unfair. Um, and for adults exact age 70 and forward are excluded. But if you noticed in the slides I showed, we actually do have data. Um, uh, WHO does have data and we can disaggregate it in five-year age groups for all of the NCDs um, that are not tracked in that particular SDG indicator. So we do have the data and it reflects the quality of the data that we get from different countries. Um, the other component of that, so it's not, I, I'm understanding the, 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 the sort of disappointment that older adults are not included in the SDG indicator, but I want to make it clear that WHO does have the data. The second thing is that what the case that we're trying to make as part of the baseline report is to say, well, what about adults age 65 or 70 and over? And when they have those conditions, how are they managed? Um, what are the things that can be done so that, uh, so that um, uh, cardiovascular disease and strokes, those, those high uh, burden um, uh, NCDs, can they be managed better? Um, rather than writing it off that this is you know, older adults and there's not much we can do, what's the evidence base? And so we're going to give an example in one area um, where there's actually a growing robust evidence base on what can be done. And I think this is the other tact we can take to try to say, remember, we need to move that mountain. And that mountain requires the social engagement, the political involvement, as well as that technical expertise. So we're trying to bring in that technical expertise to help move that mountain. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ritu. Um, an interesting question kind of on the same um, lines as kind of data around the world. What are we learning from healthy aging from societies like Japan who are, have the, um, the goal of living to 100? So what are we learning from those centurion societies? Well, first of all, we can learn from all countries. And I think that I mentioned, for example, we have these case studies moving forward. Uh, and uh, I was very pleased in a recent meeting we had of the consortium on evidence, uh, on, on metrics and evidence for healthy aging, that um, the group from Finland and from Ghana were exchanging ideas because my colleagues from the National Institute of Public Health in Finland were delighted to see the way the Ghanaians had organized their case study. So coming to the question though about Japan, uh, first of all, Japanese, J the government of Japan has been um, one of the important countries, among others, that have been really pushing WHO uh, to think about these issues. And they're very keen to innovate and have um, different experiences across the prefectures so that they can also see what works. So I think one of the interesting things from Japan is this innovation spirit. Uh, and we can learn a lot. Every country can emulate that. 
Uh, we can also um, appreciate the interest in um, not only the innovation in terms of trying out different uh, approaches to address uh, difficult problems, um, but also truly innovation in looking at what are the different ways we can scale up uh, a good idea. And I think there are many examples in Japan um, that we can learn from. Um, my colleague, uh, 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 Yuka Sumi, uh, who's uh, working on and uh, pushing forward the integrated care work, uh, talks about what Kanagawa Prefecture does. And they're one of the affiliates of the age-friendly uh, network. And I think I encourage you to go to the age-friendly website and see what the prefecture of Kanagawa is doing. Um, and I think that we will have um, some really interesting examples from Japan that will be featured in the baseline report. Thank you. Thanks, Rito. Uh, we're kind of closing down on time here, so I want to take the kind of last last question for for Rito yourself. Um, if there was one key message you'd like the audience to take away from today's presentation, what would it be? Ah, well, it's that we need to work together uh, and we need to move that mountain together. And we need you, civil society, because without you, we, we won't be able to do it. And in terms of accountability and progress, it's really through your extensive um, networking and relentless approach to keep this on the agenda that enables the technical work to make to have a place to make sense. So um, let's keep collaborating. And, um, and, and I think this example of the seminars between WHO and IFA built on this shared value is shared values is irresistible to member states as well. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, thank you so much, Ritu. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time to be here today. And thank you to everyone who joined. Uh, we'll make sure we post the slides for you um, and make those available um, post-webinar, as well as all the materials. And we'll forward any unanswered questions to Ritu, and hopefully we can get those answered for you uh, at a later date. Um, so thank you so much for joining. And again, Ritu, thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, and bye for now. Bye for now, everybody.